Hello everybody, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, host of Relationship and Truth, and today I'm going to be doing a video on the subject of hell, basically. Uh, what happens to us after uh, God's judgment in um, how uh, specifically the unjust are going to be spending their eternity. Um, I can't say that when I started this channel I ever really intended to be the apologist for hell or even now that I see myself as being the apologist for hell or anything of the like. This is just incidental. It's something that I'm going to cover, uh, frankly, because the subject comes up really often nowadays. Uh, the online world especially tends to have a lot of people running around in it, some of them very well-meaning and very well-balanced, and other people that while maybe well-meaning are not as well-balanced, and then there are some people that are not well-meaning and not well-balanced at all, and uh, the online world can get rather chaotic. And one thing that I've seen online multiple times is the proposition that there is no such thing as eternal conscious torments in hell. Um, and of course, I myself, I'm a Reformed Christian who holds to the three forms of unity, and so I do believe in eternal conscious uh, torments. And so the question is, why and where do I see some of the, the major faults with uh, what other people have said? Um, and frankly, this video is not going to be attempting to deal with everything that everyone has said. Mostly I'm going to be sticking to a positive presentation of the doctrine. But just so that the other side doesn't go completely unrepresented, I decided to bring up a short video clip uh, in which a fellow by the name of Steve Gregg talks about uh, some of the issues, very, very briefly, some of the issues that pertain to the issue of dealing with um, the concept of eternal punishment and what exactly that means. Now, of course, this isn't anything wrong from him, and as I understand it, he's actually written a book on the subject talking about three views on hell or something like that, something similarly titled. And uh, like I said, um, the last time I reviewed Steve Gregg's stuff, or some stuff from Steve Gregg, um, I don't really intend to interact with his stuff all that much. It's just that when it comes to certain topics, uh, his name tends to come up just because he's put a lot of material out there online, and so a lot of people know him. And he also has a reputation for kind of taking a middle ground on different things and being able to see all sides and whatnot. And so he kind of winds up in the middle of the controversies, even if he doesn't necessarily intend to be. But given the, that he wrote a book on the subject, I think it's fair to say that he intends to be in on this con on this uh, subject. Like, So I'm going to go ahead and play the little snippet from him. Obviously, this is not everything that you would have to say about it. Uh, but I'm going to play the little snippet from him, and then I'm going to um, present the positive case for our kernel, eternal uh, conscious torments in hell as a Reformed person holding to the three forms of unity would understand it. So without further ado, I'll let Steve Gregg uh, describe the issue for us as he sees it. Does the Bible teach of an everlasting punishment in hell for the unbelievers? question is, does the Bible teach an everlasting punishment in hell for unbelievers? The word everlasting and the word eternal are words that are found in the scripture with reference to punishment in a couple of places. Uh, the Greek word is ionios, which uh, is usually traditionally translated eternal or everlasting, although its actual meaning is very much under discussion by Greek scholars and, and not all have settled on an actual meaning for that word. The traditional meaning is inadequate. But yes, it, uh, the word Ionius is used with reference to punishment in Matthew 25, 41, uh, or rather Matthew 25, 46. The, the word Ionius is in both of those verses. But the first one just talks about Ionius or everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The second of those verses, the last verse in Matthew 25 says, these should go away to everlasting punishment. So there is reference to everlasting punishment. However, Paul, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, says that Jesus will punish those who don't believe in the gospel at his coming. Jesus will punish them with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? 
There are some people who believe that everlasting destruction just means a destruction that is permanent. So that when Jesus comes back, he really just annihilates the sinners. He doesn't torment them forever, but they experience a punishment or a destruction that's everlasting, from the, and it comes from the presence of the Lord. That is, from his brightness of his appearing. Paul also says in the same epistle that the man of sin will be destroyed by the brightness of Christ's appearing. So, from the presence of the Lord, there comes this destruction of the wicked, which is everlasting. Destruction may mean annihilation, or it may not. There are times when destruction just means ruin, and it doesn't mean the end of a thing, but the destruction, the ruin of a thing. But there are many who believe that this everlasting destruction or everlasting punishment is a punishment that has everlasting results. Uh, some have pointed out that it doesn't say there's everlasting punishing, as if the punishing itself is going on forever, but it's an everlasting punishment that is a punishment that lasts forever. So if, for example, a person was annihilated, that as their punishment, and they're never, it, it's irrevocable, it's incurable, they never come back, it's everlasting, it's permanent, in other words. So there is uh, just these, really, these two passages that talk about everlasting punishment or everlasting destruction. Now, in the book of Revelation, there's a couple of passages that talk about uh, torment forever and ever in the lake of fire. This is something that is said to take place for the... Uh, the dragon and the beast and the false prophet in Revelation chapter 20. And um, also, there is said in Revelation 14, 11, that uh, there are some who will worship the beast and will experience the punishment of um, fire and brimstone, uh, and they will the, the smoke of their torment will ascend forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Uh, these are images in Revelation that sound like they're describing unending torment, conscious torment. One of the difficulties with Revelation, of course, is that it is a book written in symbols, so which which images to take literally becomes a matter of opinion, and in some cases just boils down to one's own intuitive, intuitive uh, understanding of those things. Uh, as I understand the book of Revelation, the lake of fire and the everlasting punishment uh, is, is said to apply to non-human en entities as well as human entities. I mean, uh, the dragon is a non-human entity. I believe the beast and the false prophet are not references to human individuals, although obviously the popular view is that they are. I think not. Uh, death and Hades are certainly not human entities, and yet they are also punished and in the lake of fire. At the end of the book of Revelation, the bad guys all end up in the lake of fire. And in saying about some of them, it doesn't say this about the humans who are thrown there, but but, uh, but the devil and the beast of the false prophet, it says they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That could be literal or not. It may have the effect sort of like we end some of our happy ending stories. They lived happily ever after. It doesn't really mean they literally live forever, but it meant, you know, all turned out well, permanently. And so... One could say that you know the, the devil and, and these other non-human entities seem thrown into the lake of fire. You know they live miserably ever after, so to speak, as so simply a, an impressionistic way of talking about the victory and the righting of, of wrongs that, that will take place. I personally think that the Bible is not clear on the subject of whether uh, the suffering in hell is everlasting or not. All right, so that is something that I did basically just by way of introduction to introduce people who are not familiar with the idea that there would be anything else that the Bible would teach other than eternal conscious torment in hell, that there are in fact other people out there who believe different things, and um, a lot of those views are very popular online, are propounded very often online. And like I said, I'm not necessarily going to take the time to really be addressing Steve Gregg himself. He's written an entire book on the subject. This is going to be a relatively quick video, probably somewhere around an hour. Of course, whenever I do an estimate, it always winds up being way off. But uh, it's certainly not going to be exhaustive, and it's certainly not going to be as exhaustive as an entire book is going to be. But, um, like I said, I wanted to introduce the concept that there are other views that are out there, 
and then go ahead and get into what does the Bible actually positively teach. And so, um, just uh, by way of notes, um, I'm also going to avoid uh, some of the material that could be stated from Revelation uh, for a lot of the same purposes that Steve Gregg mentioned in that interpreting those passages has a lot to do with how one views the symbols in the book of Revelation and the eschatology that one holds to as they approach the book of Revelation. And so in explaining those passages and why they would or would not be for a particular in favor of a particular view, um, you really wind up having to discuss eschatology to a very great deal. And I want this video to be relatively short, so I'm going to avoid a lot of the passages where you wind up having to discuss this other topic in great depth. Um, not that I don't believe that those would also support my view, I do believe that they do, but um, just because I don't want to have to explain something and then explain something and then explain something that relates to all those other somethings, I'm going to avoid certain passages. Um, so I'll be consistent with Steve Gregg on that one. Um, but as far as the positive presentation of what the Bible actually does talk about in the context in which it talks about, um, I would agree with a lot of people online and historically uh, who would say that the common emphasis that we have in modern Christianity today upon the concepts of an eternal heaven and an eternal hell are somewhat misplaced. That is, the Bible doesn't really talk about things in terms of heaven and hell per se. They're, they're words that we use to describe you know, the eternal state and they're useful in that sense. But when the Bible talks about heaven, it's usually not talking about it as an eternal state for humans. It's usually talking about uh, the transcendent dwelling place of God or it's talking about the literal heavens, the sky, you know, the air, where the clouds are, where the stars are, stuff like that. Um, it's usually not talking about it as an eternal state for mankind a lot of times. It's something w that we kind of use as a, as a modern term for the concept, but it's not really how the Bible usually would use that term. And the same thing for hell. Um, depending on which Bible translation you'll read, they will use the translation hell. But what that means um, isn't necessarily exactly uh, as we envision it. Uh, that's not real. The Bible isn't really centered around heaven and hell as its own distinct terminology. That's terminology that we've developed in time and has become very indicative of a lot of forms of modern Christianity. But biblically, the big issue as far as what happens after we die wasn't the issue of heaven and hell per se. Instead, the biblical term that gets used a lot more often is the idea of resurrection. And just to show you what I mean, uh, let's go to Acts. So we'll go to the book of Acts and chapter 24 and, and verse 15. Acts chapter 24, verse 15. By the way, I wrote notes down here, so if you see me looking down, that's what I'm looking at. I'm just looking at my notes so that I don't go too far off and talking about random things. Uh, but just presenting the, the general biblical worldview here. What is it that in the biblical worldview, and especially in the New Testament, what was it that people were looking forward to as far as what would happen after they die? And the answer is resurrection was on their mind. In Acts 24, 15, it says, Having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. This is Paul speaking when he's... Um, going to be brought to Jerusalem and eventually gets sent off to, to Rome when he appeals his uh, case, when he's being accused of crimes by the Jews. And there's a particular point where he makes it about the issue of the resurrection. In Judaism at the time, there, there were different schools of thought, and there actually were quite a few. Uh, the two most famous that show up in the New Testament, uh, especially as it relates to this issue of resurrection, are the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection, while the Pharisees did. Also, the Pharisees believed in spiritual entities, that we ourselves have a spirit, we have a soul, and um, 
that there are angels who are transcendent beings that God himself is an entirely transcendent and being and he's capable of making spiritual beings um, such as angels such as demons so on and so forth whereas the Sadducees would usually deny the bulk of that they admitted you know that there is indeed a, a God who orchestrates things on this material earth uh, but aside from that they really didn't have much of a view of transcendent spiritual things at all the, the supernatural was not something that um, really figured into the Sadducees' way of thinking to any great extent. So, uh, but even aside from that, there are other nuances historically that would definitely exist that would be different combinations of these things. And the New Testament as a whole takes uh, a stand on these issues. It takes a stand on a lot of these issues that were current in the day that people were debating, is it like this or is it like and this? And uh, indeed, the uh, the New Testament presents the idea of resurrection in a positive light, that there will in fact be a resurrection. And as Paul puts it here, and that's the primary person who's speaking at this point, um, he says that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. And this is a concept that you can find at least implied in the Old Testament. It shows up much in a much more upfront way in the New Testament, but even in, say, passages like Daniel 12 and Isaiah 66 and places like this, you have this concept of there being some kind of a final judgment and eternal life being granted to one group, eternal punishment, eternal death, whatever being granted to the other group, but everybody is brought up for judgments. And there are going to be two basic outcomes. There is going to be one outcome for those considered just before God, and there's going to be another outcome for those considered unjust before God. And this is what you see referenced throughout the Bible. Now, there are particular passages in the New Testament where uh, it just talks about the resurrection, and it doesn't talk about the resurrection of the just and the unjust separately. It just talks about the resurrection. And a lot of times in those passages, um, it's actually it's talking specifically about the resurrection of the just. It'll only mention the resurrection. It won't qualify it. But a lot of times it's implied that it's the resurrection of the just that is being talked about. For example, in Philippians... Provided I can get the spelling close enough for this thing to recognize it. There we go. In Philippians 3.11, this is also Paul speaking. He says, and this is, of course, just a part of what he says in the broader context, but he says that by any possible, oh, sorry, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Does this mean that there are people out there who are not going to be resurrected from the dead? No. We just read in Acts uh, 2415 what is that yeah, that was 2415 where Paul very clearly thought that the unjust were going to be resurrected as well uh, when he's talking about here about the resurre uh, the resurrection from the dead he's talking about the resurrection from the dead uh, that is for the just for those that are in Christ so a lot of times if it's mentioned by itself there's a good number of times where it's talking specifically about the resurrection of the just but yes, technically they believed in both a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of the unjust. And that Christ um, was uh, the one who allowed them uh, to be a part of the resurrected just instead of a part of the resurrected unjust people. Um, that that was something that was unique to being in Christ. Okay. Now, that brings up... Um, another issue is, okay, there's this great resurrection, and there's going to be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust are all going to be resurrected, but the outcome is different, and the outcome is different based on what? It's based on the judgment of God. And so this idea of there being a resurrection was brought eh, is tied to the idea that God is going to judge all people for all things. And so we have some passages such as... Uh, John 5.29 that talks about this. There are other passages as well. Uh, but in John 5.29, Jesus says, uh, Those who have done good 
to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Uh, at least I believe it's Jesus speaking at this point. Sometimes it's the, uh, the author, but at this case I do believe it is Jesus that is speaking and says, those who have done good will go to a resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to a resurrection of judgments. In that case, it's not using judgment in a generic sense, but in a very negative sense. Um, will receive a, a negative sentence. Uh, another uh, place that speaks of this that is germane is Acts 17, and we'll look at verses 30 through 31. Uh, this is again Paul who's speaking at this point in Acts. He says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Uh, this is an especially important passage because it connects the issue of resurrection to the judgment. And this is why Jesus rising from the dead was such an important thing, biblically speaking, is because Jesus is raised as the judge of the earth. That's how Paul understands it here. And the reason why he's raised as the judge of the earth is because the earth will be judged at the resurrection of the just and the unjust. He is the quintessential uh, representative of mankind who has been tempted in every way that we are and yet being sinless and yet having borne the weight of his people's sin and uh, providing uh, substitutionary atonement for them and at the same time because he's also been through every temptation that every kind of temptation that we've been through and yet remain sinless through it, he's in a position where he can righteously judge and also righteously uh, provide mercy. Um, and he is the first fruits of the resurrection. He is the guarantee that this resurrection is yet to come, that God will rescue his people and he will indeed condemn the unjust. Um, Jesus, when he says he is the resurrection and the life, that is a core and essential part of the biblical worldview. Like I said, the biblical worldview wasn't fixated on the concepts of heaven and hell so much as it was the resurrection and the judgment that would accompany that resurrection. That company that would um, uh, condemn the unjust and the uh, same resurrection judgment that would gather, bring in, and uphold and vindicate uh, God's just. So we see that the Bible's emphasis is more so on resurrection than it is on heaven or hell per se. And we also see that this uh, resurrection is going to be accompanied by a judgment uh, that will distinguish um, those who are just in God, who are declared righteous in God, and specifically in Christ, and those who are unjust, those who are not righteous in God. All right. And now this is something that in the biblical worldview is presented as something that's going to happen at more or less a specific time. Not that things that happen supernaturally can be really accorded at time in the sense that we're used to it. Uh, but it's usually presented in those terms of some future event that there is a coming judgment eventually uh, to which all people are going to be subject. That's the biblical terminology that's used. So it is put in a chronological order. Now, is that chronology as we are used to thinking of time? That's that's a debate for another time. Um, but biblically, the concept, at least, is that there is going to be a future point at which all mankind was going to be judged. And then the question comes up, well, what happens until then? If there is some sense in which it is an event in time, then what is going to be going on until this resurrection and judgment happens? And... Uh, the answer to that is that the unjust are held in a place of torment until that point of judgment. Uh, just as, so that you can see what I mean, the Bible does talk about this, that there is going to be a holding, if you will. And for the unjust, it is going to be a 
place in which they're held that is not going to be pleasant. It is going to be a place of torment. Uh, so 2 Peter 2.9, for example, says, Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And you can go back and you can read in verse 4 where it specifically starts out by talking, uh, at least at verse 4, it is talking about how God is keeping uh, uh, the unrighteous supernatural uh, beings in chains until the day of judgment. And then it goes through and talks about some things that have happened in history where God uh, rescues some people and he condemns others and so forth and so on and so forth. And then it culminates here in verse 9 where it says that the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. So the concept here is that until this day of judgment occurs, and like I said, as to when exactly it is going to occur and at what exactly the when is and what time means in that context is something that we could certainly have an extended discussion about. But in the biblical concept, it is a future event that happens in time. And until then, as the text says, the unrighteous, the unjust are under punishment until they come to that judgment, which seems a little bit weird. If the judgment is what condemns them as being unjust, why are they being held in judgment until then? And that actually is not something that's really different from our own own world if we think about it. A lot of times if people are accused of heinous crimes, for example, before they've even gone to trial, a lot of times they will be held in jail, not formal state penitentiary prison, uh, but they will still be held in jail at some point, and there'll be a bond that'll be posted, etc., etc. Uh, but it will be a place of waiting, and it's not as bad as it could be. It's not as bad as getting sent to, um, you know, the state pen or something like that. It's not as bad as it could be. And jails usually have better visitation rights and better visitation availability and things like that. It's usually, and the population is usually, we'll say a little bit more subdued than you would get in a state pen, things like that. Um, it's not as bad as it could be, but it's definitely not a pleasant place either. And that seems to be the, the concept that we have presented here in passages uh, such as Second Peter 2.9 and other similar passages that say that the unrighteous are kept under punishment until the day of judgment. It doesn't mean that there isn't going to be any future judgment and that that future judgment won't in some way be worse. But until that time, they are going to be held under punishment. And another interesting uh, place uh, that talks about this, uh, that provides us a really unique insight into it, is a parable that Jesus tells in the Gospel of Luke. We'll go over to Luke 16, and we'll go through uh, verses 22 through 23. 22 through 23. Um, parables are something that we always need to be a little bit careful of when it comes to interpretation of the Bible. Because parables are meant to get across one basic point. Uh, they're an illustrative story that is meant to get across a key and central point. A lot of the details of parables serve to get across that point. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they uh, that all of those details are necessarily something that we should latch on to. Um, it's just the main point of the parable that you can really sink your teeth into. And so we have to be careful about how we use parables in that. In the case of Luke 16, there's a parable that is told about a rich man and a poor beggar named Lazarus. And we're going to be reading an excerpt from that. And the parable culminates by saying that um, there are those who in their lifetime had available to them the writings of Moses and the prophets, and that is what these people should look to, that even uh, the testimony of someone who rises from the dead, because that's what's requested in the parable, that the, uh, uh, that the poor man rise from the dead and go warn the rich man's uh, relatives about what is waiting for them if they continue to act in the selfish, unjust way that they're acting right now. And the culmination of all this is that they should have listened to Moses and the prophets, uh, and if they had not listened to Moses and the prophets, if that wasn't good enough for them, then 
the testimony of one who rises from the dead won't be good enough either. Um, it is a passage that is very, very, very much so in favor of the authority of the written word and the authority of the written word over uh, personal revelations and things like that. It is a very strong statement of Jesus' own opinion of uh, Scripture. Uh, but in the midst of telling that parable, there is this understanding of what uh, is going to happen after we die uh, that is presented. And um, like I said, the details of parables you always want to be careful about. But what's interesting about these details is that they form the mechanism by which the, the story is propelled. And Jesus seems to be playing into tropes and understandings that were common at the time. It's not like anybody got up after the parable and said, but that's not how it really is or anything like that. Um, and so this seems to be indicative, at least of the understanding of the time, and certainly seems to be something that Jesus was okay with. And so while it wasn't the main point of the parable, it does seem to match what we saw in 2 Peter 2.9, where it's, in 2 Peter 2.9 it says that the unjust are held under punishment until the day of judgment at the, at the resurrection of the just and unjust. And what we see in Luke 16, 22 and 23 coincides with that. I wouldn't take it as a main proof text. It exists in so much, it can be used that way in so much as 2 Peter 2.9 already sets a foundation, so on and so forth. But it does coincide with that general worldview. In Luke 16.22 it, it says, The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, and by the way, the Greek word um, Hades, Hades um, doesn't mean hell in the modern sense. It literally means the place of the dead. The New Testament uses the word uh, Hades, Hades, in basically the same way that the Old Testament uses the word Sheol. And so when it's talking about the grave, the place of the dead, in the Old Testament, Hades is basically the same place in the New Testament. Um, it's just the difference in language, Hebrew versus Greek, but it's basically referencing the same thing. It's the place of the dead. So in verse 23, it says, And in Hades, the place of the dead, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. So we again, we have this reinforcement. There are other passages that are not a part of parables that state it much more explicitly, like 2 Peter 2.9. But this is still in coincident with that idea that the unrighteous, that the unjust, are kept under punishment, kept under torment, until the day of judgment. That seems to be the understanding that Jesus had. Certainly was the understanding that Peter had. Um, up until the time of judgment, there is indeed this period of uh, torment. There is this period of torture. There is this period of punishment that the Bible very clearly speaks about. Now, going along with that, that uh, the unjust, the unrighteous, are held in a place of torment until um, the time of judgment. There is also the flip side of that, which is that the just, the righteous, are held in a place of peace until the time of judgment. And you see that even in this passage, uh, where... The poor man is taken to Abraham's side, and it's seen as being a good thing. This poor man is not in a place of torments. He is in the company of the righteous people who have gone before him, such as Abraham. And these, uh, these places, um, like I said, this is something that's occurring in the supernatural realm, so there's a certain amount of symbology that is involved. But these two places are separate and distinct from each other. And if you read the rest of the parable, it talks about a great chasm being fixed between the two so that people cannot cross from one side to the other. That these are two very distinct places in the place of the dead in Hades or in Sheol. There is a place in Sheol for uh, the righteous, and there is a place in Sheol for the unrighteous. And for the unrighteous, it's going to be a place of torment. It's going to be a place of punishment. And for those who are considered righteous before God, it is a place of peace. It is a place of unity with other godly people who have gone before you. It is a place of being at Abraham's side, as it were. Um, older terminology, uh, being in Abraham's bosom, in the company, close company of Abraham. 
uh, who's considered in great many respects the the father of uh, the faith in so much as a lot of the specific predictions about uh, there being a blessing for all the nations and whatnot were made clear to Abraham in ways that a lot of uh, the patriarchs before Abraham didn't necessarily have. I mean, there was the uh, uh, promise that God gave concerning the serpents that the seed of the woman would crush uh, the serpent's head and those kinds of things, but we didn't get a lot of detail about that until we got to Abraham and thereafter. Uh, but that's going into other details that are not really here nor there. Uh, so you see passages like this that talk about that distinction, but there are also passages not inside of parables uh, that talk about it uh, much more positively and much more definitively. For example, in Luke 23... 42 through 43, um, there's an interesting thing that happens. Jesus is on the cross, and as a lot of people know, quite famously, he's hung uh, beside two thieves, two criminals, who, uh, well, one of them hurls insults at him, and the other one um, uh, doesn't like that at all and rebukes this other criminal for uh, for hurling insults at Christ. And then in verse 42, it says, And he said, this is the other thief, it says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, and this is another one of those things that would indicate that the people who die righteous, who are considered righteous uh, when they die prior to the resurrection and the judgment that comes with the resurrection, that they are going to go to a place of peace. Jesus describes it as paradise. And the word that is used there is actually the same word that is used in the Old Testament, or at least in the Greek version of the Old Testament, uh, for garden in, in respect to the Garden of Eden. It is not... Um, a, it's not heaven. A lot of people mistake that. They think that uh, paradise, uh, that he went to paradise means that he went to heaven. And that's not it. A paradise is a place of peace. It's a place of tranquility. Um, it's a place of rest. Uh, remember when they were in the garden, um, they did not have the curse of work put upon them. That doesn't mean that they didn't do anything, but it wasn't a curse like it was later. So it's a place that is peaceful. It's a place full without the hard, arduous work that we have now. It is it is a good place, um, but it is not synonymous uh, with heaven. And so this is one of the, the terms that is used of this other place. There's Abraham's side, Abraham's bosoms that's used in, back in Luke 16. The other synonym for it would be uh, paradise. Uh, and by the way, the uh, New Testament also uh, with reference to the bad place in Hades, in the place of the uh, dead, it will talk about it sometimes as Gehenna, although Gehenna is a really broad term. Gehenna basically is just the place of fire that can be used in a lot of different senses, but oftentimes of uh, the place of uh, the dead that is bad. And um, uh, there's another term that gets used as well, and that is um, Tartarus. Um, and it gets used as well by Peter, I believe it is. Yeah, I believe it is also in Second Peter 2, and I think verse 4, uh, where in the original text, sometimes it doesn't get translated, but in the original uh, text, it talks about um, uh, the wicked supernatural uh, beings. I can't remember if it says angels or demons there. I think it was it says angels at that point, um, but wicked supernatural and beings are sent into Tartarus, and of course Tartarus is a concept that the Greek world understood as being this place that was within Hades, the place of the dead, well specifically underneath it, that was specifically a place of torment. There's Hades, the place of the dead, and underneath it is Tartarus. It's a separate compartment that is a place of torture. And Peter borrows that terminology to get across the basic point. That doesn't mean that he agrees with the entire Greek concept of hell at all. Um, but he's but he does borrow that terminology to denote a place uh, in 
the place of the dead in Hades that is um, bad, that is torturous, that in which people undergo punishment. Um, so one compartments for the unjust, that is a place of torments until the judgments, and then there's another place, whether you want to call it Abraham's bosom, paradise, um, etc. There's different uh, things that it can be called and has been called throughout history. Uh, that is a place of peace and tranquility and union and community uh, with God's people, which is another interesting parallel. Uh, when Jesus talks about Gehenna, when Jesus talks about hell a lot of times, he talks about the utter loneliness of the torment there. But when we have Parabot is being talked about, it's a good place. It's a place where there is a presence of the godly people. And this is where Jesus uh, even goes when he died. He goes to this place that is good. He goes and he hangs out with Abraham and um, this uh, now considered righteous thief, or this right oddly odd to say this righteous criminal um, who in Christ is considered righteous even though he has been condemned as a criminal uh, gets to enjoy a presence with him um, so when Jesus dies and he's in the the grave in the place of the dead for the intervening time until Sunday morning um, he is in the presence of his people that he has come to save um, and that must have been a really awesome experience. Um, but, yeah. So this is the, the idea that we have in the Bible. It's not so much focused on heaven and hell as it is on the resurrection, the judgments. And there is this understanding that before the resurrection and the judgment, there is a time of waiting. And there are places of waiting, spiritual places, obviously, but they're put in literal terms so that we have something to wrap our minds around. And these places of waiting depend on how we are considered before God as righteous or unrighteous. This criminal that was next to Jesus on the cross being considered righteous, uh, for Christ's sakes, for Christ's sake, goes to the good place waiting, to paradise, to Abraham's bosom. The wicked people, though, in the Bible, are said to be kept under punishment until that final day, under until the day of and judgment, until the resurrection of the just and the unjust. And the places that are used to describe them include things like Gehenna, although, like I said, Gehenna isn't overly specific. Uh, but Gehenna is a term that is used, Tartarus is a term that's used. Um, but in some sense, a place of the dead that it coincides with misery, that is torment, that is punishment. It's not great. And then that leads us to our question here is, well, what happens at the judgment? Before that time, we do have punishment. But at the judgment, what happens? Is it the case that we get to the judgment and all of the unjust people are completely destroyed altogether and uh, just the, the righteous continue on into eternity? Or is there a sense in which the unrighteous do persist but it is in a state of punishment uh, of which they are conscious. That becomes the issue, that becomes the question. And as Steve Gregg mentioned in his little video that we looked at at the beginning of this, there are passages in the Bible that do indeed talk about uh, uh, the nature of torments. Is it just going to be this temporal thing up until the time of the judgment, or is the torment going to be perpetual? You're going to be held in jail until you're sentenced, and then you're going to the penitentiary. Or is it the case that you're going to be held in jail, and then once you're sentenced, you're going to be taken off to the chopping block and executed and annihilated, and you will be no more? Like I said, biblically, there is definitely going to be torments, at the very least, up until the judgment. Uh, 2 Peter 2.9, uh, Jesus' parable in Luke 16 coincides with that. Um, uh, those kinds of passages are clear that there is definitely a place of waiting. Um, and for both the, the just and unjust, there's different places of waiting. 
But the question is, of course, what happens after that? So torments are punishments for the unjust. Um, is that something that is eternal or not? And one place that even Steve Gregg mentioned is in Matthew 24. Is it 24 or is it 25? Forgive me. 25. 25, 46, it says, And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Um, and this is, of course, a parallel construction. And whatever the eternal in the eternal punishment means would have to be similar to the uh, eternal in the eternal life. So if you're saying that the punishment is eternal and that the punishment simply lasts through eternity um, and the life lasts through eternity, that's an argument that could be made. Um, but it's not one that most linguists would agree with, and I'll get to that in a second. But here's a uh, passage that does talk about eternal punishment. Uh, Steve Gregg, and then a lot of people have mentioned uh, that the word that is translated as eternal, um, ionios, is a word that can mean a lot of different things. Um, um, but we'll get to that. First, we'll just present the, the ones that he talked about. Okay, so there's the one that says eternal punishment, and the issue there that a lot of people have with it is what exactly does a eternal mean, and in what sense? Uh, does it mean uh, that the uh, punishment is eternal or that the punishment, um, the effects of the punishment are eternal? Or does it even not mean eternal at all? Does it mean something else? Does it really mean punishment for an age? Well, if that was the case, it would be life for an age. I don't know anyone who would interpret Matthew 24, 46 that way, but that one is out there. Let's also go to the other one that he mentioned just so that we have it in our memory here. Second Thessalonians 1 9 says they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. I personally don't like that particular translation where it says away from. Um, that's not actually technically what the Greek says. Let me go ahead and scroll down to the Greek here. When it says um, yeah, uh, and the system isn't bringing it up like it's supposed to. Um, but uh, what it actually has, says here is um, how best to explain it. Uh, sometimes explaining the, the differences in Greek is a little bit hard to do, but I will just point out the, uh, the preposition here, apa, apa, is used in both parts of 1 Thessalonians uh, 4.9. Um, when it says, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might, those are actually both apa. And since they're used in parallel like that, you'd expect them to have the same meaning, not a different meaning. That's a rather odd thing in any language. I mean it like this here, but literally with the same kind of construction and the same kind of order, I mean a completely different thing, other thing over here. That's just semantically, linguistically, that's not really a, a viable interpretation. Um, this is an interpretation that's the one that's given here on the screen is one that's done to kind of to pacify certain people who don't like the idea of God actively punishing people. But like I said, it's the exact same word used in the exact same construction in both places in the passage. So uh, when it says uh, the from here, it should be the, the same from. Uh, uh, and specifically coming from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Uh, this de destruction is the result of uh, God's... Um, uh, this destruction is the result of God's presence, and it's the result of his glory, and it's the result of his might. It's how it reads in Greek. But there are a lot of people who don't like the idea of God actively punishing people, and so it gets translated in different ways. And I'm not saying it's a completely unviable translation. 
except for the whole parallel construction thing. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. The main point that I wanted to get across here is that in Matthew 24, 46, what a lot of people object to is uh, the Greek word Ionios, because Ionios uh, is debated, obviously. Otherwise, Steve Greg wouldn't have mentioned it. And then here in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1 9, it talks about eternal destruction. And the word that is used for destruction here is this word right here, alethron. And the question is, well, if this is eternal destruction, uh, does that mean that they are destroyed? Are they annihilated to be no more? Or is it destruction in the sense of being brought to ruin, of never being able uh, to rise again, of never being able to be what they once were? For example, even in uh, the Bible, you have them talking about the destruction of cities. That doesn't mean that the material of the city no longer existed, but it was never able uh, to rise again. It was not as it was designed to be. If you destroy a wall, for example, that doesn't mean that the wall is necessarily annihilated. You could still have chunks of the wall laying around, it, but it's no longer going to be able to function as it was in, originally intended to function. Is that the sense in which destruction is being used here? And so those are the things that are controversial here. Um, what do the words Ionios and uh, the, uh, the word for uh, eh, which often gets translated as eternal, and then also the word for destruction, alethros, uh, actually mean in the context of God's uh, wrath uh, upon evildoers. Uh, how is that understood? Uh, Steve Gregg says that these are the only two passages outside of the book of Revelation that talk about eternal punishment, and frankly, I would disagree with him. Uh, but the bigger issue here is really how do we understand those terms, Ionios and Alethros. There's some debate about it, but how are we to actually understand it? And to talk about that, we need to talk about um, linguistic analysis just for a little bit. Um, frankly, I don't appreciate what uh, Steve Gregg uh, did in saying that the translation of eternal for Ionios is wholly inadequate, is what he said, or totally in inadequate, something to that effect. Um, you can go back and look at his video and, and see exactly what he said, but um, his point was that it was inadequate and that Greek scholars debate what exactly it should mean. And that is not true. If you're talking about a Greek scholar in terms of a linguist who is developing a lexicon and using typical linguistic tools and typical linguistic methodology, there isn't a debate. Um, it's not, not in the sense that you have a group of linguists on one side saying, no, Ionios means eternal, and a group of scholars on the other side saying, no, Ionios doesn't mean eternal. That's just simply not what is happening. What is happening in linguistic uh, field is that it is recognized that pretty much every word in every language has what is called a semantic domain, a domain, a realm of possible meanings, if you will. And you can find fairly standard resources. This is just one that I happen to have access to here. A Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature. This is the third edition. This is called BDAG for short, and it's for uh, the primary linguists throughout history that have contributed to it, like Bauer, Donker, Art, and Gingrich. Um, and that's why it's called BDAG. BDAG 3rd edition is what this is. And you can look up Ionios in this thing, and it will tell you that in certain contexts, it means eternal. And you can also look it up, and it will tell you that in certain contexts, it doesn't mean eternal. It means something more akin to age longer at that time. There, it's um, not necessarily eternal, but is a general indi in indicator of age, so on and so forth. 
Um, so this idea that there is this great debate going on between scholars is just totally bubkiss. Now you do have theologians who have studied Greek, of course, uh, but you do get uh, theologians a lot who have, and many of whom who have studied Greek, who disagree as to how a particular passage should be interpreted at what Ionios would mean in this particular passage at this particular time. Does it mean this or does it mean that? Um, you will get that, and you will definitely find uh, a plethora of material out there that will argue that in passages like this, like 2 Thessalonians 1 9 and Matthew, uh, what was it, 24 or 25? 25 46, Matthew 25 46, uh, that Ionios there should not be translated as eternal, it should be translated as something else. You'll get theologians or people who are acting like theologians who know Greek to one extent or another who argue about this. But as far as the lexical resources themselves made by the actual linguists, they'll say that both are viable alternatives, that it could mean eternal or it could mean something more akin to age or time, something like that. Uh, there's a sense in which it is a definite period of time, and there's a sense in which it is an indefinite, ongoing, um, limitless period of time. It can be used both ways, and the lexical sources, like I said, they'll say that. It's, the issue isn't in the, in the understanding of the Greek. The issue is in people who are trying to do theology at the very least sometimes with more or less awareness of what is going on in Greek. And that brings us to the issue that is really at play here. The issue isn't whether it means this or whether it means that. The issue is how do you know if it means this or how do you know if it means that? Because it could mean both. Both are within, both the idea of age and both the idea of eternity are both within the semantic do domain of Ionios. And when it comes to the issue of destruction there, the idea of annihilation is within uh, the semantic domain, and the idea of ruin, not necessarily annihilation, but the idea of ruin in the sense that you are no longer what you once were, and you're no longer going to be returned to what you once were. It doesn't mean that you cease to exist, but just simply that you no longer are what you once were. That also is within the semantic domain of Alethros. Uh, that's not a question. It's not a question of what uh, it could mean. The question is, how do you know which of those meanings apply at a specific time? And the linguistic method that is actually used to make the lexicons and to figure out which passage goes where, because in the lexicons they'll give you a list of passages. It doesn't; it's not ex exhaustive in most lexicons. There's a few that are, uh, but most lexicons, even really big ones like BDAG third volume, which is one of the biggest ones, and it's usually the one that's uh, most often referenced. Ironically, on both sides of the issue, um, but even in there, it will give sample passages of saying that in this particular passage we know that it has this particular definition. In this other passage over here, it has this particular uh, definition. And that goes back to linguistic methodology. How does a linguist know which meaning is being applied to a word at each time? And the issue always comes back to context. And context is uh, both the, the writing itself, the immediate context in which it is written, you know, the material that comes before it in the text, the material that comes after it in the text. The context also uh, comes from outside the text, though, as well. In the context of 2 Thessalonians 1.9 and in the context of Matthew 24.46, at least the immediate context within that book itself, there isn't a whole lot of extra details that are given as to what is exactly meant by eternal uh, punishment or eternal destruction. What does Ionios mean here? There's not a whole lot of extra helpers uh, in the immediate context in those passages. I, was, I, I think that probably Steve Gregg and I could agree at least on that much, that there's not a whole lot else that is in the primary context that is in those primary books that really defines it. And so when you can't get something from what you might call uh, the uh, might, you might call the local context within the passage itself. Um, 
you have to start looking outside of the passage for context. And the linguistic method has always uh, included the assumption that people use the language that is available to them at their time to write, including the wording and the phrasing and the general understanding of that time and place. And so if we want to understand what is meant by Ionios and Alethros in passages like 2 Thessalonians 1, 9 and Matthew 24, 4, uh, 46, and we don't find sufficient context from doing that in the immediate context, we're going to have to start looking at what is going on culturally. That is, these authors are going to be writing using the language that is current to them, and they're going to be influenced by what has come before them and what is happening around them. And unfortunately, this is a really early point in history, and so we don't have a whole lot of examples of stuff that comes before them. Obviously, there's the Old Testament, uh, but like I said, the Old Testament is uh, more so uh, in a state of anticipation about a lot of these things. And so it doesn't give a whole lot of detail. I wouldn't say that it doesn't give any um, there are definitely passages that do talk about it, um, but a lot of those passages are pretty far removed from the time of the authors, and so that needs to be considered. Um, the New Testament authors, although they're very much so obviously aware of the Old Testament, and they're definitely aware of the Old Testament in Greek, the form of Greek that they use is actually not overly similar. It's similar enough. Uh, but people who study Old Testament Greek, the Septuagint, and the New Testament in Greek uh, realize that they are very much so distinct uh, types of Greek. They, they are not the same. And that the ways that uh, terms are used are even different between uh, the two Testaments. Um, things change a little bit with time. And so to understand how verbiage is being used at a particular time, you need other things that are being produced at that similar time. And usually what you want is something that comes fairly close before it, not too far back, because like I said, language changes with time. And going from Old Testament to New Testament, there's definitely some changeover uh, that happens. So you don't want to necessarily reach all the way back into Old Testament material, um, but further back the New Testament. And then, of course, stuff that is contemporaneous with the New Testament. Um, and generally, we don't have a lot of material that's like that. I, um, I, like a lot of people, would be very cautious about using stuff that comes after the time of the New Testament because then you're going to have people, you know, kind of putting their own spin on the New Testament language and they'll start using it their own way and oftentimes in a different way. Um, but within the time frame, uh, you have people using the language that is available to them, and they're going to use it uh, according to the dictates of the time. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll agree with everything that is said at their own time and place. Just because they use the language doesn't mean that they're, uh, the terminology and language of a particular group doesn't mean that they agree with it wholeheartedly. For example, Paul uses terminology that the proto-gnostics were using. He talks about uh, the aeons in Greek. It doesn't come across in English translation all the top, uh, time, but he talks about the aeons in Greek, and he talks about concepts that uh, the proto-gnostics would have been aware of. And he says a lot of things that are in juxtaposition to those things. So he's using the language that was current at his time, talking about the aeons and things like uh, this. Uh, but he uses it in a very different way. He contradicts the normal understanding of it, and he specifically contradicts the understanding of it. Uh, for example, in the proto-gnostic understanding, Jesus is one of the aeons, one of the ages, and Jesus is not full deity. He's on a chain of gradation that goes up to full deity, that goes up to full enlightenment. Um, Paul directly contradicts that, though. He says that Jesus was before all ages. He's an uncreated um, being, and that all things were created through him, and that there's nothing that exists outside of him. Uh, Paul uses the language to turn it on its head and tell them that they're wrong. And this is something that linguists would generally expect of any kind of uh, literature, is that people exist in their own time and place, and they use 
the language that is around them and they'll either use it passively, that is just simply imbibing it and letting it pass through and they use it as would be expected in the general culture or uh, by that certain subset uh, whose language they're using, they'll use it passively and just let it pass through uh, and which would indicate their general agreement with that worldview or instead of using it passively, uh, they'll use it contradictorily, uh, like Paul does with the proto-Gnostic language, where he takes their terms and he turns them on their head. And uh, the Apostle John does the same thing in his epistles. Uh, the Docetics um, believe that uh, Jesus did not actually have a physical body. He only appeared to have one. And so, G uh, so John goes through this and says that every spirit that says that Jesus came uh, in the flesh is from God. He uses this as a distinguisher, saying that the uh, things that these guys are saying is wrong. He's using a lot of their terminology. He's talking about the flesh and these kinds of things, and whether or not Jesus actually came in the flesh or not, but he's using it in contradistinction to them. And contradistinction is something that takes time. It takes qualification. Uh, Paul explains in contrast to the proto-Gnostics, that Jesus was the, uh, the one through whom all things were created. He is the one who is before all ages, that in him dealt the fullness of deity bodily, um, which are all things that the proto-Gnostics wouldn't believe. And Paul takes the time to explain this. He doesn't just passively use their language. He's using their language, but he is explaining as he goes, and he's providing a lot more context, and he's contradicting uh, the um, the uh, expectations of that particular group. He's using their language, but he's contradicting uh, their point. And the Apostle John does the same thing with regard to the Docetics. Um, and this is how linguists generally interpret all different languages from all different time periods, is that in order to understand a given text, you need to understand what is going on around it, and then you need to assess whether the people are using these outside influences passively, going along with it, agreeing with it, or are they using it contradictorily? Are they taking the time to explain why it's wrong or not? Are there exceptions that they're uh, listing? Are they taking the time to explain uh, something that otherwise could have been passed over? Uh, and this is how it comes to the issue of how Ionios and Elethros, oh, sorry, Alethros, Alethros, are used in the New Testament as it comes to God's divine judgments on people. Um, not temporal judgment, but his judgment in the sense of um, his, his great judgment, not the, the incidents that happen in our daily life, but the great judgment of God, you might say. How is it being used in that context? And like I said, to do that, what linguists are going to do is they're going to try to go back to something that is before the time of the New Testament, but not too far back, because then language changes if you go too far back, and to stuff that was contemporaneous with the New Testament. As, a something, as far as something that goes back but not too far back, a good example would be uh, the book of Judith. The book of Judith, of course, is not... Um, a part of the Protestant canon of the Bible, and justly so, I would say. It's not canonical. But it is something that the uh, Jews of Jesus' day and of the Apostles' day certainly would have been aware of. And what's more is that the New Testament actually exhibits quite a bit of awareness of the book of Judith, as well as the other um, uh, what we would, might call the apocryphal books or the deuterocanonical books or the ecclesiastical. I personally prefer ecclesiastical. Uh, Rufinus, Church Father Rufinus used that terminology, and I think it was good terminology to use. But they actually show quite a bit of usage of non-canonical texts. In fact, uh, there are something like 700, let me look it up here so I don't get it wrong, 745 745 either quotations or allusions in the New Testament to non-canonical works, including Judith and various other uh, ones. 
Uh, a lot of people don't know that, and it's mostly just because they don't spend a lot of time looking at a lot of primary sources. The particular source that I'm looking at here is the 28th, whoops, is the 28th edition of the Greek New Testament, uh, the Nestle Alon text, as it were. And in the back, they have this huge, extensive listing of all of the citations and allusions to various works of, of history that occur in the New Testament. And there is a fairly lengthy section. There's also a lot that are include the Old Testament. But there's a lot of them that include references uh, to non-canonical works as well. And the fact that the New Testament authors quote non-canonical works actually isn't all that surprising uh, to most people who think about it because they've actually read it and they're aware of it. Some of the allusions uh, you're only going to notice if you're reading it in Greek because that's where you see the parallels in language. It's not as easy to pick up in English. But some of them, even English speakers will get. For example, uh, when Paul is speaking to the Greeks, there's one point where he actually quotes from their guys, where he quotes uh, from uh, the great Greek uh, thinkers that were, were influencing people at the, at the time, and it's recorded in Scripture, in the book of Acts, uh, that he does this. Uh, that kind of stuff does happen. And f also in the book of Jude, I think it is, that you have... Uh, a quotation from the book of First Enoch, which is obviously not in the canon either. Uh, so the New Testament authors do use the language of these things that were available in their times that came before them, as in the case of Paul quoting from great Greek, uh, Greek thinkers. Um, I think most of those uh, those quotations, there's like two quotations there, and I think both of those came be from before the time of uh, Paul. And then in the case of Jude, that was also something that came before their time. Not super old. Uh, First Enoch was, we don't have just any historical evidence of it before the 4th century BC. And so it's closer to their own time than a lot of the other Old Testament, uh, well, the proper Old Testament works would be. Um, um, so you have these things that are available to them, that they're aware of in their time, that they're making use of. Uh, and a lot of times in agreement with it passively, or if they don't agree with it, there's often going to be some kind of contradiction to it where they take the language and turn it on itself, like Paul did with the Proto-Gnostics, like the Apostle John did with the Docetics. And in the case of Judith specifically, according to Nestle All in 28th edition, there are 11 allusions or quotations to the book of Judith found in the New Testament, including a couple of quotations. Looks like Matthew and Mark from what I can tell here. Uh, but as it relates to God's judgments of people after they die, and what is meant by whether or not it is eternal, as we would understand eternal, or is Ionios being used in some other way in that context when it talks about God's judgment of people after they die, uh, Judith does come out on one side or the other of that, and specifically, in, where is it, Judith chapter 16 and verse 17. Is this going to bring it up? No, I'm searching in the wrong version. Sorry, the version that I was searching in is one that only included the canonical works. I'm going to switch out to one that does not include, sorry, or that does include non-canonical works. So Judith 16, 17. And reading it from the Greek is going to be a little bit hard, so we'll go down to the English version here. Judah 16, 17 says, Woe to the nations who plot against my race. The omnipotent Lord will punish them in the day of judgment. So again, in the New Testament, we see this concept of the day of judgment. And this day of judgment wasn't talked about a whole lot in the Old Testament, but in intertestamental literature, like Judith, we see the development of this idea. It's based on Old Testament principles, of course, uh, but you see a lot more development in the intertestamental period. And for the most part, the New Testament imbibes most of it just as is. It uses it passively. It's not contradicting it. It says, yeah, this is how what's been understood to our point, and we go along with it. There's some points where they don't, and that's why a lot of these intertestamental works would not be considered completely canonical, is even though there's a lot that the New Testament does agree with, there's parts where they obviously differ. Um, 
But this is one part that they seem to have imbibed is this idea of the day of judgments that coincides with the resurrection that I already talked about. There's the resurrection, and after the resurrection, there's going to be this judgments. And it goes on. It says, to send fire and worms for their flesh, and they will wail in full consciousness forever. So what is the understanding that is put forward in the book of Judith regarding God's judgment, and specifically uh, uh, God's judgments as it is um, associated with the resurrection of the just and unjust, the great day of judgment? Um, is it the idea that these people will um, be annihilated? Is it that they're going to be punished for a time, and then after they realized how wrong they were, they'll get out, or something like that. No. Uh, the book of Judith is very clear as to what the understanding of the Hebrew people of the time was, and would be indicative of what the Hebrew people of the time would and be, and that is that they will be in, they will wail in full consciousness forever. It's pretty clear that um, this is something that is not annihilationism. It's not a complete and utter, total annihilative destruction. And as far as the eternality of uh, is concerned, it is definitely eternal. It's not some other meaning of Ionios. It is forever. And in fact, the terminology that is used here, it doesn't actually use the word Ionios. Um, and I wouldn't want it to use uh, the word Ionios to prove my point, because my point is how should we interpret Ionios. So it's not going to use the same word, but it does use a somewhat similar word, Ionos, which is not Ionios. They are two different words in Greek. Um, but the way that it's using it here in Judah 16, uh, 17 is actually very similar to other passages in the Bible, at least in the Greek Bible, like Exodus 15, 18, for example, that uses a very similar uh, construction and very obviously means forever. So, for example, Exodus 15, 18, uh, we have Iona, which is an inflected form of the same word. It's not Ionios, it's a different word. Uh, but it's the same kind of uh, construction being used in the same way, and it very clearly means forever. I, Exodus 15, 18 is a short verse. It says, the Lord will reign forever and ever. And the meaning should be sufficiently plain there. Uh, there is no one that takes the Bible seriously, I know, that would say that Exodus 15, 18 means that God will reign for an age, for a limited, indeterminate span of time. I don't know anyone who would interpret Exodus 15, 18 that way. And so my argument is that if you're going to interpret it, interpret Exodus 15, 18 this way, or it is indeed eternal, that it is indeed ongoing, um, then Judith 16, 18 would have to be the same. Or sorry, 16, 17. Would have to be the same. Uses the same word, well, a afflict, flected form of the same word, but it's not Ionios, it is a different word. And the understanding is that at the day of judgment, that's what Jude, and the book of Judah says, the omnipotent Lord will punish him in the day of judgment that is associated with the resurrection to send fire and worms for their flesh, and they will wail in full consciousness forever. Just as much as we would say that God reigns forever and ever in Exodus 15:18, the same kind of construction is found here. If we would say it applies there, it also applies here. What's the understanding that the people had uh, going into the New Testament period? Because like I said, this is from the intertestamental literature. Going into the New Testament period, what is it that the Jews are saying regarding uh, God's punishment on the Day of Judgment? Is it that it is um, that it is just outright annihilation? Is that it is a limited period of torments, and then either after that they get annihilated, or after that uh, then they're redeemed and brought into heaven. What is the understanding at the time? The understanding at the time is very clearly 
that they are going to be in full conscious torment forever and that this is associated with what happens at the day of judgment. So the question then becomes, first of all, is this the only thing that's going on in the history that's going around? This is in the past. Judith is, of course, written before the New Testament books. So this is the world in which the New Testament uh, writers have received uh, this kind of terminology going around. Um, and then, and they're using a lot of the same kind of terminology in the New Testament. For example, even Jesus uses very similar terminology. Um, Mark 9:48. And before I go there, I shall go 9:47 through 48. Uh, but before I go there, I do want to draw and draw attention to the fact that in Judith, it says that in the day of judgment. Uh, that the omnipotent Lord is going to send fire and worms for their flesh. And then it goes on to say they will wail in full consciousness for forever. Uh, Jesus actually says a very similar thing in Mark 9, 47 through 48. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in the wrong version again. I'm going from the non-canonical works to a canonical works. So I need a different version. Hey, okay. Try this again. Mark 9... 47 through 48, Jesus says this, And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. And this is interesting terminology that uh, Jesus is talking about here. He uses the phrase "kingdom of entering the kingdom of God rather than being thrown into hell, and hell there. I believe is Gehenna. Let me go ahead and check on that real quick. Yeah, Gehenna. Yeah, it doesn't really look like Gehenna in Greek, but it's a transliteration from Hebrew, and those wind up looking weird. Um, but yeah, we'll be thrown into Gehenna. Uh, but this is in contradistinction to the kingdom of God. And so it's not using the language that we had before of what happens before uh, the judgment. Because before we have the judgment, we have, you know, the uh, bosom of Abraham, we have paradise, things like that. This is something that is greater. This is something that is bigger. This is something um, that is on a whole other order of magnitude that Jesus is talking about here. And like I said, the word Gehenna is sometimes used of that intermediate state of torment. Uh, but the word itself actually isn't overly definitive. It basically just means uh, fire, a uh, place of fire, uh, more or less. Um, and so it's not overly determinative. And then Jesus goes on to say, It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Verse 48, Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Very similar to what it said back in Judith 16:17. In uh, Judith 16:17, it would uh, said that they would, you know, have worms and fire sent after them, and they would be in conscious torment for forever. Here, Jesus basically combines the image, uh, the images of eternal con uh, torments and the idea of the fire and the worm. And so you get the combination being a worm that does not die and a fire that is not quenched. And this actually goes with Old Testament material as well. In Isaiah 66, and I believe it is verse 24, uh, you get pretty much that exact same phrase where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And you read through the rest of Isaiah 66, and you don't actually even have to go all the way back to the beginning, although Isaiah is a good book to read anyways. But you can start in like verse 15 or so, 15 or 16, something like that. And at the end of the book of Isaiah, it's talking about the judgment of God. It's talking about the new heavens and the new earth. And when it is talking about the people that God has condemned, it talks about their worm not dying and their fire not being quenched. It describes them as the ones that God has defeated and the ones who are dead, at least in that sense, eh, before God. But it's interesting that the way that that was understood in Judith, eh, by the time of Judith, is that that was to be representative of eternal conscious torment. And the way that Jesus is using it here is that you're going to be thrown into hell and there is 
Um, this, uh, a part of it that seems to be implied that uh, uh, you still partake in, that you still experience. You experience an undying worm, you uh, experience an unquenchable fire. Uh, that's an interesting parallel there. And so, so as far as the linguistic methodology is concerned, you have something that is in the same time frame, general time frame, coming a little bit before the time of the New Testament authors that speaks very clearly of eternal conscious torments. And the New Testament authors use very similar language and they don't bother to contradict it. Okay, it's not like Paul with the Proto-Gnostics, it's not like the Apostle John with the Docetics where they're intentionally contradicting uh, what those groups said. No, the same kind of terminology is applied, but without contradiction. Okay, but like I said, that's uh, a passage that comes before. There are also a lot of passages, a lot that people don't know about, but there's a lot of passages that were actually written very near uh, the time of the New Testament, basically concurrently with the New Testament. And uh, one of those uh, works uh, that actually happens to talk about this issue is a work called Fourth Maccabees. A lot of people that are familiar with the Maccabees are only familiar with First and Second Maccabees, but there's actually uh, four Maccabees that are more common. I think there's a few traditions out there that might have more than four Maccabees, uh, but most of the others are getting pretty late and not really applicable to our time. Fourth Maccabees, though, is interesting because it's actually written in the same time frame as the New Testament. Um, most of, historically, I should say, it was put, well, if you go far enough back in church history, it was attributed to Josephus. A lot of people today don't think that that is overly accurate just because Josephus has a style that's pretty distinct from 4th Maccabees. And so it doesn't seem overly likely, but again, he's the only person in history that has ever it's ever been directly attributed to, so hey, why not? And everybody in history has recognized that this is most likely a 1st century work, which of course Josephus was a 1st century author, so it would match that. Um, but even if it wasn't, Josephus said that it, um, even within, say, uh, the tradu and Jewish culture, a lot of them would say that it was still a Jewish work that was produced probably uh, by the time of the persecution under Caligula, uh, Caesar, Cal Caligula, Emperor Caligula, um, which would have ended in 41 AD at the latest. Um, so, there is that. So it's actually a pretty early work. Um, probably not too different in time frame from, say, the New Testament book of James, probably written pretty close to the same period of time. Uh, the book of James, of course, talks about the diaspora, the dispersion under Jewish persecution. And the fourth Maccabees has a lot of the same concerns about persecution and being a general... Uh, first century work puts it in that same kind of time span. So it's basically contemporaneous with the New Testament. And that book um, is also alluded to several times in the New Testament. Judith, like I said, was alluded to in the New Testament at least 11 times, according to the Nestle Allen uh, 28th edition. And then 4th Maccabees is alluded to quite a few more times, 32 times, 32 different passages from 4th Maccabees are alluded to in the New Testament. Um, that's actually really interesting. Um, so, the New Testament definitely shows an awareness of 4th Maccabees, and there's actually a lot of material in 4th Maccabees that is really interesting to look at the comparison between the New Testament worldview and the uh, worldview of, new, of the Maccabees, and specifically 4th Maccabees. There's a lot of intertextuality there. Um, this doesn't mean that there's complete agreement between the two. There's not. But um, as far as understanding how the language was used at the time, 4th Maccabees and books like it are very, 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 very useful. So as in the case with Judith, where we saw that the understanding at the time that Judith was written is that there's going to be a great and final judgment, and that the great and final judgment will include, indeed, 
eternal uh, torture. It's not just punishment leading up to the time of judgment. There is an ongoing conscious torment that occurs afterwards. Okay, we saw that in the book of Judith, which comes well before the time of the New Testament. Um, fourth Maccabees is going to help us answer the question of whether or not this kind of understanding is still present at the time that the New Testament is written. And whether or not it coincides with the language that the New Testament is using, and if the New Testament is using this language passively, that is, it's not contradicting it, uh, but it just simply uses that kind of terminology and passes over it, then that's an indication that it would agree with the worldview of this work at that particular point. Not at all points, but as it's using that particular language of that particular topic, it would be an agreement. So let's take a look at 4th Maccabees, and I need to change my version again, because Maccabees is not a canonical work. All right, so let's look at 4th Maccabees, and look at a couple passages there. We'll go 10, 10 through 15 first. And of course, reading it directly from the Greek is not going to be very helpful for most people. So we'll switch down to the English version here. And just to give you a little bit of context, at this point in 4th Maccabees, it's talking about some early Jewish uh, martyrs. And this is one of those martyrs who is speaking here in verse 10. He says, We most abominable tyrant are suffering these things because of training and divine virtue. But you, because of your impiety and bloodthirstiness, will endure unceasing tortures. So again, you have this idea of the judgment of God, and the ter terminology that is used here is of eternal conscious torment. You will endure unceasing tortures. That is very much so eternal conscious torment. And the terminology that is used here is very different from, uh, the, or I should say the specific words here, the overall syntactic range overlaps, but the specific words here uh, are different from the words that are in dispute, Ionios and Alethros. Those are the words that are in dispute in the New Testament uh, that even Steve Gregg and people like him would mention, you know, we don't know exactly what Ionios means. Well, the fact that Ionios and Alethras have a wide semantic range is well known, and any decent lexical source is going to mention all the possibilities and those kinds of things. It's not a surprise that there are different meanings that are available for those words. The question is, what does it mean in this context? What does it mean in the context of God's judgments upon evil people after they die? And in this case, the understanding that is presented in 4th Maccabees, which is a work that is contemporaneous with the New Testament, in fact is referenced, or at least alluded to, in the New Testament 32 times, um, the understanding is that it is unceasing, that it is a truly eternal, <coughs> excuse me, that is truly eternal in the modern sense of the word. Okay. But like I said, the Greek word that is used here for unceasing is not uh, the same word that is at dispute, because then uh, you really wouldn't be proving anything. You'd just be having, here's another passage that has the exact same verbiage in it and doesn't specify anything. The wording that's actually used here is a lot more specific. So let me go back up to verse 11 here and the Greek and see if I can get it. Yeah, here is... Uh, the word that is at play here, akadalutois, akadalutois. Have a lexicon of the Septuagint here. The other one that I showed you before was of the New Testament. And so when it comes to Old Testament works and works that are associated with the Old Testament, which 4th Maccabees really kind of shouldn't be because it was written during the New Testament time period, but it's still presented in Septuagint works. It's Septuagint studies is a very interesting area of studies because it covers actually a lot of time and it's not in nice and neat as people would like it to be. But looking up the proper definition here, if I remember correctly, it is a really short definition. Um, compared to Ionios and Alethros, this one's entry is exceptionally short. 
Uh, if I can find it. Okay. Uh, Katalutas. The definition is one word long. Perpetual. Don't know if you guys can see that. Katalutas. Perpetual. There we go. Just above my wiggling index finger there. Katalutas. Perpetual. Um, some words have a very wide semantic range, very wide semantic domain. Others have a very tight domain. Agatolutas is one of those ones that has a very tight semantic domain. And part of it comes just from how the word itself is formed. That alpha at the beginning of it, a katalutois, a, that is a negation in Koine Greek. So it's saying definitely not this. And katalutois is basically something that is terminable. So it is something that is not terminable. So therefore perpetual, eternal in the proper sense. And that is the verbiage that is used here in uh, 4th Maccabees, uh, chapter 10, verse 11. Unceasing tortures. That's where the unceasing comes from. Didn't mean to look that up. That's okay. We'll get around that. So we'll endure unceasing uh, tor uh, tortures. The unceasing there literally 100% means unceasing, and there is no debate about uh, that whatsoever. What's interesting about the passage, though, is that, of course, it continues on, and then it will start using the language that we see from, say, Matthew 25, 46, and 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. So we've already seen where it unquestionably says that it will be eternal conscious torment. You will endure unceasing tortures. If you're going to endure it, you're going to have to be conscious for it, and it is unceasing, and it is torture. Eternal conscious uh, torment. That's it's about as clear as you could possibly be. But then, of course, the passage goes on, it says, when he too had died in a manner worthy of his brothers, they dragged in the fourth, saying, do not display you too the same madness as your brothers. In other words, don't be stupid like him, but obey the king and save yourself. Just do what we're asking you to do. Verse 14, but he said to them, you do not have a fire for me so very hot that I should play the coward. Verse 15, by the blessed death of my brothers, the everlasting destruction of the tyrants, and the everlasting life of the pious, I will not disown our noble brotherhood. This is really interesting because verse 15 here uses the exact words that Steve Gregg in his short little video and that a lot of people would debate and say or is debatable in this context. When you're talking about eternal conscious torment in the Bible, you know, these terms are just not, uh, Ionios and Alethros, are just not well defined enough. Well, if we look at the literature surrounding the New Testament, that the New Testament itself alludes to, in this case of 4th Maccabees, 32 different times, guess what? They do specify what they mean by using words that are much tighter in their semantic domain, which we saw before in verse 11, and then now, they use those same words that are under dispute in that same exact context. So the everlasting that's here is Ionios. The destruction that is here is Alethros. Let me see if I can go ahead and go back to that in the Greek. Yep. Ionion. It's in just an inflected form of Ionios. And then Alethron, which is an inflected form of Alethros. The two words that a lot of these people, including Steve Greggs, say, oh, it's just, you know, these words can mean just about anything. Well, in this particular context, what was meant by the eternal destruction was already mentioned back in verse 11. What was meant by this in verse 11? He says that you will endure unceasing tortures. Eternal conscious torment was already in view in the passage. 
and then by the and then when we go down to verse 15 when we're still talking about the gut and judgments of God it uses those for, uh, words that are in dispute but it's already used in the context of eternal conscious torment so what does that tell us about how these words are used in this context of God's judgment it really the Ionios in this context really does mean everlasting and that the destruction here is not synonymous with annihilation because you have to be conscious uh, for it. You have to be able to endure the tor uh, torment. Okay. What is meant here is abundantly clear. And that's why for a great many Bible translators throughout the years, they haven't had a great um, uh, trouble when it comes to Matthew 25, 46 or 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. They translate it like they do in those places as eternal or everlasting, referring to Ionios, because the external literature that we have, say from Judith or say from 4th Maccabees, is very clear that this was the Jewish understanding at the time, and that the New Testament authors themselves are not taking uh, the time to pause and contradict it. Instead, they're using this language passively. They're just simply using it and moving on. Um, that satisfies all the linguistic uh, criteria for translating it the way that it's typically translated as being everlasting or eternal for Ionios. And then, like I mentioned with the destruction that is mentioned here, the alethros or alethron, depending on the inflected form that you're dealing with, that also, in this particular context of God's judgments, the surrounding literature is very clear as to God's judgment uh, being eternal conscious torment and so when they use that terminology that is used even in these passages, like 4th Maccabees 10.15, there it really is no conclusion to come to, but that it is meant to be eternal conscious torment. And even if we move on from here a little bit to, let's see here, 4th Maccabees chapter 12, which is still relating uh, the account of these early Jewish martyrs. What does it say in 4th Maccabees 12.12? 12? It says, For these deeds, justice will store up for you a fire more fierce and everlasting, and tortures which for all time will not release you. Now, of course, the everlasting there is Ionios, uh, and so... That's, that's what is in debate. But the rest of the phrase, which for all time will not, uh, will not release you, isn't what is in debate. The context is really clear as to what it means. Okay, we might not know exactly what the word behind everlasting means, but for all time will not release you is pretty stinking clear. And this, again, still is in 4th Maccabees. We had a passage back in chapter 10, verse 11, that didn't use the words that were in debate, that were very clear about this being eternal conscious torment. We have here in chapter 12 that what is in view here is eternal conscious torment. And then sandwiched between 10.11 and 12.12 is 10.15, which does use the words that are in dispute in the context of these other two passages, eternal conscious torment. So when Ionios and Lethros are used to speak of God's judgment of people after they die, given their condemnation as being a part of the unjust, that it is really eternal conscious torment. And that pretty much is the end of the matter. Um, like I said, the biblical worldview is not so much focused on heaven as hell as we are. It is focused on resurrection. And there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. A lot of times in the Bible, when it talks about uh, the resurrection, it's a lot of times it's referring to the resurrection of the just. For example, when Paul says that he wants to attain to the resurrection, he's talking about the resurrection of the just, the resurrection that is in Christ. Um, and that at the resurrection, there is going to be a great judgment. And that until the time of that judgment, people are held in waiting. And for the unjust, it is a waiting period that is rather unpleasant, that is torturous for those who are considered just before God. It is indeed a very pleasant waiting period. And then the, at the judgment, those who are condemned of God are going to suffer eternal punishments 
everlasting destruction. And that in the context of how language was being used at that time, as indicated by works that immediately precede the New Testament, like the book of Judith, and by works that are written contemporaneously with the New Testament by people who had a general Jewish worldview, uh, that the general worldview of those people at that time, of Jewish people at that time, as indicated by books by, uh, like Judith and books like uh, Fourth Maccabees, was that the judgment of God was indeed um, eternal. That the judgment of uh, God was truly eternal conscious uh, torment. That's what we see in Fourth Maccabees. That's what we see in Judith. And that's how they use the language. That was the expectation. And we see the New Testament using the same language, Ionion and Alethros, in the same kind of context, passively. That is, they don't take the time to stop and pause and contradict it. They don't take the time to take it and turn it on its head like they do in other places, like where Paul uh, engages the proto-Gnostics and uses their own language of aeons and all these kinds of things, but he turns it all on its head. He doesn't do, uh, the New Testament isn't doing that here. And the same thing with John with the Docetics, where he takes uh, their language of Jesus being spirit and saying that Jesus came in the flesh instead, where he's taking the time to contradict what that particular group um, believed and use their language, but in a contradictory way. We don't see that happening here when it comes to uh, God's judgments. Instead, the surrounding language from Judith and 4th Maccabees that would have been available and certainly was available to them at the time that gets alluded to in the New Testament multiple times, the book of Judith 11 times, uh, 4th Maccabees 32 times, which is quite a bit, especially for an, a non-canonical work. Obviously, the canonical works are going to get mentioned far more often, but for non-canonical work, 11 times and 32 times is quite a bit. And... Uh, it uses the same language that those passages do, um, but it uses it passively. It doesn't take the time to sit there and contradict it, which means, according to basic linguistic standards, that the New Testament does not disagree with those works at those points. That doesn't mean that the New Testament completely agrees with everything that is taught in the book of Judith or in 4th Maccabees, for that matter. But at these points, it is borrowing their language and it is using it passively, which by any fair assessment would say that it agrees with it. Uh, it would be the same thing as if in the modern day, I say that you should all engage in social distancing. Okay, that is a phrase that is very, very much so modern. You talk to people about social distancing even a year ago, let it go decades ago, it really wouldn't mean much. Um, social distancing? It's, you mean you're antisocial? Um, it, just, it would not mean what it means today. But if I say you should all engage in social distancing, I'm using the term that is out there and I'm stating agreement with it, that would be a passive use of social distancing. If I'm saying I am not going to engage in social distancing and you shouldn't either, um, which is not what I'm necessarily saying, but you get the point. If I'm taking the time to contradict it and as or even manipulate the language a little bit and say uh, social, uh, social stupidity or something like that, where I play on the words a little bit when I'm uh, using the language in contradistinction to the worldview I'm presenting, then it becomes clear that I don't agree with it. But if I'm just using it passively, you all should engage in social distancing with me. Then what happens? Uh, I'm using it passively. That means I agree with it. Same thing in the New Testament. Like I said, I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with social distancing or not. If you follow me online, you know what my opinion is on all of that stuff. And the short version of it is I think that there is good sense in taking due precautions, but I think that some of the things that we've done as a society have been a bit of an overreaction, to say the least. Um, I wouldn't jump to one extreme or the other, you know. Oh, there's nothing what, uh, wrong whatsoever, and so, you know, go... Lick handrails. No, that's really not good advice anytime. Um, but at the same time, I'm also not for shutting down an entire country, uh, you know, and shutting down the economics and laying people off of work, like me, because uh, I got laid off work and all those kinds of things. But that's not the main issue here. The main issue is eternal conscious torment. And my point is very simple. 
the New Testament uses language that could possibly, that has a wide semantic domain. Ionios and Alethros have a wide semantic domain, but in the particular context in which they're using it, speaking of the judgment of God, the surrounding cultural context indicates that this was understood to be eternal conscious torment. The New Testament uses the exact same language, and it uses it without contradistinction. It uses it passively, ergo, it agrees with those other statements. The worldview of 4th Maccabees and Judith, when it comes to this particular issue, is the same as that of the New Testament, and any honest analysis, fair analysis of the issue, linguistically sound analysis, uh, is going to say the same thing. That's, you know, peop uh, the way that we understand the language of a particular time is by looking at all the materials at that time to see how it's used. And if in that particular context of talking about God's judgment, this is how it's consistently used throughout the literature, you know, both before, not too far before, but relatively near the time of the New Testament, a little bit before and concurrent with it, if that's the general understanding and they're not, and the New Testament authors are not making a big deal about it and uh, standing in contradistinction to it, then they agree. Um, that's just the way that language works. And so in references like BDAG, the Greek English uh, lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature, um, you will find places where it talks about Ionios and Alethros in fairly definitive terms, saying here it means eternal. Here it means uh, destruction not as annihilation, but destruction in the terms of a ruin from which you can no longer return to your previous state. Uh, it will use it like that because linguistically, it's certain. There's no reason to deny it. Uh, yes, like I said, those words have a broad semantic domain, but when used in the context of judgments, that semantic domain is becomes quite limited. When you limit it down to that particular issue, there's only one way that it gets used in the surrounding literature of the time. Okay, Both before the New Testament and during concurrent with the New Testament, this is how that language was used of that particular subject of God's judgment. It's eternal conscious torment. There's no other alternative that we actually have in the literature that would be applicable. Okay, If you're talking about the germane literature, the literature that comes relatively soon before the New Testament era or concurrent with the New Testament era, that's the only alternative that there is. Okay, If anyone knows of any other alternative for how those words would be used in that time era, by those people, from people who have a general Jewish background, general biblical background, and people who are not that uh, people that the New Testament would stand in opposition against, like the Sadducees. For example, the Sadducees wouldn't agree with any of these statements here because they didn't have an idea of the resurrection at all. That's why I started out this whole video talking about the importance of the resurrection in the biblical worldview, and especially the New Testament worldview. Okay. Okay. Yes, you can find sources that are in keeping with, say, the Sadducees that would deny that there's eternal conscious torment because they deny that there's a resurrection at all. Um, but for people who hold to the same general worldview regarding those kinds of issues, to pertinent issues, do they agree on this issue or not? That's the issue, and there are none of them that I'm aware of. At the time, this language in the context of God's judgments for people who actually believe that there was going to be a resurrection, it always meant eternal conscious torment, and I can't think of any exception. Okay, Not that there are a whole lot of works out there to begin with that would be relevant, but the ones that I am aware of, it's the only way that it works. All right. So, thank you all very much for your time and attention. For those of you who are in Christ, go with God and be blessed. And for those of you who are not, I would pray that you would come to an understanding of the true Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.